how are you all? Um, my name's Tony Birch and I'm here on behalf of both University of Queensland Press and the Wheeler Centre in conjunction with Black and Bright, our wonderful Black Writers Festival. Tonight's event, Black, Loud and Proud First Nations Classics 2024, is a celebration of eight new releases in the University of Queensland Press First Nations Classics, following on from the wonderful initial release we did last year of um, eight books also. Before I go any further, obviously it's important that we do an acknowledgement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander country, and we do it importantly during this week of NAIDOC celebrations. So tonight we're gathered, as I'm sure many of us already know, on the lands of the Wurundjeri Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to all of our elders past and present, and we are honoured to be speaking and performing here tonight um, reflecting the enormous struggles of our forebears on this country, this country specifically that we're on tonight, and of course Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander countries um, right across the continent. We also welcome you, so any um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the audience, we welcome you wholeheartedly. But for the rest of you also, obviously people coming from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, we want to pay our respect to you during NAIDOC week as hosts on our own country and we really feel grateful that you have come along tonight to enjoy in this celebration. So I'm sure we'll have a wonderful night. We're going to have a um, wonderful conversation tonight but we're also going to have some performances and to start us off we are really lucky to have a remarkable young First Nations woman, Tamala Shelton and Tamala is a proud Bunjalung and Lama Lama artist and her performance just now of what's known as a yarn bomb. So she's going to do a yarn bomb. So I'm not sure what a yarn bomb was, but I don't think it's violent or <laughs> by any means. Um, we're really proud of her work and we're really proud that she's agreed to lead us off tonight. So welcome Tamala to the stage. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I'm just going to get my piece up. It was such an honour to write for this, and I wrote an original piece for this tonight, um, to the NAIDOC theme, Keep the Fire Burning. Fire. Elusive. Undefinable. The English call it a collection of substances come together to create heat, light and smoke. Fire itself, a process in motion. It does not begin with itself or end with itself. It's something whose very existence requires a coming together of other things to give it life, to sustain its life, to end it. It's not so hard to imagine that we too are a collection of many things that come together to weave the fabric of us. In each moment, new stitch, new seam, morphine changing, I am different to the me I was when I fell asleep last night, to the me I was when I woke up this morning, to the me in the moment before I stepped on this stage tonight, different to the me in this moment and this one. And this, fire. Come, let us gather round our oldest companion, the meeting place of all our ancestors who spoke of its origin, either stolen from the gods by curious mortal hand or gifted with a warning to be used within our land. Whatever the tale, they all agree that it comes from another place and should be handled wisely lest it set the world ablaze. Fire has followed us all our history still, cooked our food, lit the nights, and warmed us from the chill for as long as we have been we. Picture this, look down at a time lapse of the earth in all its different stages and in each a fire burns. 
Which ones I cannot say, lit by whom I do not know, whether little campfire flicker or a wild inferno glow. See it come to life and die out, time and time again. For someone somewhere meets up with our old mysterious friend, lights it, keeps it, quenches. Light keeps quench. Light keep extinguished. They tried to snuff out First Nations people's flame, pulled us from our campfires, banned from doing burns. Ecocide and genocide always walk hand in hand, take turns. Light keep quench. Light, they took their oldest friend, forgot how to tend it gentle, used it for their own desires, saw power in its potential to forge great weapons and tools burning more than met their needs. Now smoke replaces air, global warming takes the lead. They forgot our oldest friend. It does not do well alone and will remind us in fires wild, burning all we love and own. So that now, as we march towards our most cer certain climate demise, we see our future painted before us in hues of red and blue, horizon lines on fire, earth reduced to blackened soot, homes reduced to ash, throats dry, bodies burnt. Ash Wednesday, Black Saturday, in our future, they will name no days of the week, for the days will gather and collect in the charred remains of what we forgot. Fire. We must remember our oldest friend, who needs us as much as we need it, who is a being of collaboration that we are always in relationship with. Fire is a communication of its environment changed. It is the change. It is what embered in the bellies of all our great change makers who breathed something from nothing, who gave life to a new way, who spoke the words that others were too afraid to speak, who stood on the front lines and rallied into the streets, the ones who created change, for change is created. Maintained, light keep quench, light keep. Let us quench what shouldn't be a flame. Let us light our future right. Let us keep the fire burning. The ones our resistance fighters began in 1788, Pemelwoy, Windradine, that Ujuru, Kathwalker, and Eddie Marbo, Lingyari, Kathy Freeman have lit and kept. The ones we cannot let be quenched after the rejection of the voice. The one that Camp Sovereignty has lit and the tent embassy has kept aflame, making it the longest continuous protest for First Nations rights in the world. These are the fires our elders have gifted us that we must now maintain and keep for the young ones still to come so that their future may be colored by more than just two hues. So let us keep the fire burning to keep all black bodies warm. Keep it burning in your belly when the pigs shove you to the floor. Keep it burning when they ask you, how much Aboriginal are you though? Keep it burning when they try to silence any voices that's not their own. Keep it burning when they blow up another sacred site, when they cut down old growth trees, when they try to divide our fight. Keep the fire burning. Do not let it die out. Give it breath, give it gust, make it rage, make it burn. We must remember that we too, like the flame, are the sum of many parts and must come together truly before we can even start. So come, let's light the fire, maintain our elders' flame, keep the fire burning, for we create the change. Thank you. Thank you so much. So <clears throat> now we know what a yarn bomb is. It is truly, bu truly beautiful and powerful. Um, while Tamla was 
reading, I was thinking, of course, we pay enormous respect to our elders, but as we spoke about in regard to this collection yesterday at the ABC, we have a remarkable generation, generations of young people coming through who are going to guide us into the future. So that was absolutely stunning. So please um, give Tamla another... So as I said earlier, um, this is a wonderful collaboration between the Wheeler Centre, Black and Bright and UQP. And when we started this process last year, we republished eight remarkable books by First Nations authors and each of those books had an introductory essay by another First Nations writer and often, of course, a great admirer of the authors whose book was being republished. Last year we celebrated writers such as Janine Leanne, the remarkable Ruby Langford Guinnaby and Archie Weller. And it's wonderful to see a new generation of not only First Nations readers, but readers right across the country reading these books again, or in some instances reading them for the first time. The eight authors that we are celebrating tonight are Larissa Barrent, the late and great and beautiful Lisa Belair, Vivian Cleveland, Dylan Coleman, Ruth Hegarty, Gail Kennedy, Sam Wagan Watson, and Alexis Wright. So all of their books are here tonight. Amplified Books are here selling copies of the books. And we would really appreciate if you appreciate these books that you purchase one or more of them. I think there is a box set that you can purchase at a, at a special price. And these books have become really celebrated and uh, books that um, I have the first series at home and they are wonderful books to teach, wonderful books to read and I'm sure you'll grieve me when you get hold of them. What we're going to do now is we're going to have the first of our conversations between um, a writer and a writer of great appreciation. So our first couple and they will give um, longer um, introductions of themselves, not too long Fiona Foley. Um, <laughs> so the first pairing that we have up are two remarkable Aboriginal women who I know very well and have known for many, many decades. Um, Fiona Foley and I have op shopped across the globe. Um, we, we first got op shop fever together in, in Berlin and we, we cleaned out an op shop of all its warm winter coats, I remember, on one occasion. So would you please welcome Larissa Barrent, our award-winning writer, filmmaker, and author of Finding Eliza, Power and Colonial Storytelling, and also multidisciplinary artist, she calls herself, um, Dr Fiona Foley. Um, so it's Professor Larissa Barrent and Dr Fiona Foley. <laughs> Ah, thank you, Tony. I'd like to pay my respects to the Kulin na Nation. Uh, I've known Lar Larissa for a few years now, so we're quite comfortable with one another. Yeah. I'll introduce myself first and then introduce Larissa. So I come from the Wandana clan of the Butchler Nation. Our country encompasses the largest sand island in the world, known as Gari, formerly known as Fraser Island. I've been working in the visual arts and exhibiting for the past 40 years. The first exhibition was titled Curry Art 84, held in Sydney. I'm currently an associate professor at the University of Queensland in the School of Historical and philosophical inquiry. So, Larissa. <laughs> Larissa Barrett is a Uralari Gamilaroi woman who is Distinguished Professor and Laureate Fellow at the Jambana Institute of Indigenous Education and Research at the University of Technology, Sydney. She is an award-winning author and filmmaker 
She, Larissa is a trustee of the Australian Museum, chair of the Community Spirit Foundation, a board member of the National Library of Australia, a board member of Sydney Dance Company, and a board member of the National Justice Project. She's someone you want to know. <laughs> Larissa is a national title holder and a member of the Uralari Aboriginal Corporation, registered native title body corporate, as well as a member of the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council. And the first question <laughs> <laughs> is, in what ways has your work explored the... No, sorry, that's your question to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what inspired you to investigate the Eliza Fraser story? Oh, you so funny. <laughs> um, thank you, Fiona. Um, Yama Gaitanea, Yarada, uh, Yualarai Gamilaroi, Dinawan Bula, Milian Bula, uh, Girabi Dirinbandi D, Naya, Yala Gidmaga, Winanayi, Wurundjeri, Bunurong, Kulin, Wale Dan, Galga, Nanu, Wale, Baga, Nale, Buddha, Gagiga, Gabaninda. Um, as you said, that's in my Yualarai language, which you pronounce so beautifully, Fiona. Thank you. Um, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about language um, as we go along, because it's something that's close to both our hearts. Um, so I know that when Tony introduced us, he said that the book had introductions by people who admired our work. But for me, the genesis of the book, Finding Eliza, actually, um, I think, started with my engagement with your work, Fiona, which is why it's been so important for me to have you do the um, introduction for a range of reasons. People might think that's just because um, the Eliza Fraser story took place on your traditional country and you were a great mentor to me through this project. But actually, I think for me, this idea of thinking about how we deconstruct the colonial narrative, I started to really um, have the spark of understanding that process when I first came across your work, Butcher the Woman. And for people who aren't familiar with that very iconic work of yours, um, these are self-portraits of you um, reclaiming the imagery of Aboriginal women. And uh, I know we go back away, and I don't want to age us by saying how long ago it was, but I, it was before, it was just as I was about to undertake my doctoral studies, I think I, I engaged with this work. And it, I guess the power of it was that I could see how you were deconstructing the colonial narrative. You had that thing of challenging the way that we were just, particularly as women in those archives, nameless, um, uh, ethnographic kind of figures. But there was something about the power of the stance of your pose, the defiance, that was like the assertion of sovereignty. And I think those two interweaving ambitions of deconstructing and challenging the colonial while asserting the sovereign have kind of been um, an influence through a lot of my work. So I would position that as a kind of um, seed for thinking about these kind of projects. And then when I was overseas, um, actually in Canada in the prairies, I came across literature of Métis women who were abducted, sorry, of white women who were abducted by the Métis. And they had this whole captivity narrative there. And what I found interesting about this literature was it was written by First Nations people who were actually saying that none of these things happened, that these were all overblown stories. And it tweaked this thing that I remembered, this Eliza Fraser that Patrick White had written about, Sidney Nolan had painted. And I thought, I wonder if that's the same thing. And I started to investigate. And I actually realised it was so much more and a quite horrific kind of um, attempt to romanticise a frontier story, a captivity narrative, um, that uh, 
really demonised your people, who were completely nameless in all of her accounts. Um, it ridiculed, demeaned and lied about your culture. And then I think, you know, we can get into those aspects a little bit more, but I guess at the end of the day, as somebody who was studying law and was looking at the way in which that story was used beyond your borders, and I know it had its own impact on your land, um, but even um, beyond your borders, it was used as a, a kind of tale that told of our barbarity, justified the taking of our land, justified the attempts to so-called civilise us and assimilate us. And um, I thought the story was really powerful in that way. And I, I was interested in looking at that to see how much of your oral traditions had still survived to tell that counter story. So that's probably the genesis. So um, you probably, I noticed you wrote some stuff down and you know the story, so you probably have some things to say off the back of that. Um, well, I did write down four words, the four C's in the introduction, <laughs> not being rude. No. Um, conqueror, conquest, colonisation, cannibalism. Mm. These are all things that you touch on in Finding Eliza. And for me to write the introduction, I had to reread the book again and try and make sense of it. So I used those four pillars as a way of discussing all of the information and the research that you had done to bring the, the book alive. And there was a lot of um, research of other writers, like white women who had written about an Aboriginal people from their perspective. But it was a narrative that was sort of a fake narrative in some ways. It's, they could never really get to the core. And Eliza Fraser, as she travelled after she was rescued off Gari, and then went back home to England and, you know, told fanciful stories of the Butchler people. It was another falsehood that was in the public domain. And I don't think Aboriginal people for a very long time have had a voice in this country. It's only in the last, oh, let's say 50 years that we're making serious inroads into having, being assertive about what's happened in this country historically. Mm -hmm. it, it's, um, and, and it, um, I guess the thing too is that something like her story is sort of painted as a colonial narrative, that it's something that happened years and years ago, but you hear those same stereotypes that are in that story, you know, and, and particularly in that book, in her telling, in her telling, in her stories, and the, the ones that were contemporaneous to her that were incredibly sympathetic and, thought to use, and sought to use her story. Aboriginal women are painted as even worse than the men. You know, there's this stereotyping of us as jealous of her whiteness and that we were, we were that, that um, her being amongst Aboriginal women when she was a slave of the slaves. You still sort of see that. Um, you know, in the way that Aboriginal women, when they're victims of crime, will go missing, there's not the same interest in it. And even the sort of sense that we are cannibals or that our, our cultures are barbaric is such... I mean, so many of us had to listen to that sort of rubbish during the referendum debate. Whatever side we were, we were on or wherever we felt we landed, that's the rhetoric and that thing about cannibalism is just people... So even Patrick White, he didn't dispute it. He said, oh, no, it's some kind of noble thing. It's a kind of communion with the soul. I was like, no, we were not cannibals. Um, and, and actually, you don't have to... I guess the thing that was surprising to me about doing that research was how how little you had to go into the original sources to see how false they were. This wasn't, you know, a hugely 
um, a forensic thing to have to do. You could see these original sources that were supposedly this, um, where the truth of our, um, our barbarism comes from, and could see how, how lacking in authenticity or knowledge these, these things were. Um, so I guess my question to you is, this is a big project. <laughs> You've already asked the question half to yourself, <laughs> to me anyway, so it's not a surprise. No. But, you know, this is a big project of your work too, which is to reclaim the, the stories and the perspective of your community, which you did with, with Bachelor Woman. You've done it with a lot of your work. Yeah, as an artist, it's about writing bachelor people back into the narrative because we've been written out. Mm. And as a young person growing up back home, um, different times of my life, and then studying in Sydney, uh, you look around all of these country towns and there's hardly any acknowledgement of the Aboriginal nation um, so for Bachelor people, you know, there's two townships, Maraburra and Harvey Bay. Maraburra, they celebrate Mary Poppins of all things. And <laughs> Harvey Bay, I don't know what that celebrates. Maybe the gateway to Gari. And both of them are problematic because there's no visual iconography of uh, Bachelor people. So. I always look at the landscape and imagine I've had some wonderful public art projects here too in Melbourne um, where I did a piece in 1997. It's on permanent display at the Melbourne Museum called Lie of the Land based on a piece of history of John Batman and Wurundjeri people from the city centre here. And I just think like, a part of my premise is to write Aboriginal people back into the visual landscape and also to um, uh, unpack the history so that there is a strong foundation to the work. And Larissa um, opened or launched the inaugural speech for witnessing the silence outside of Brisbane Magistrates Court earlier this year. I mean, it had been... Um, commissioned 20 years ago, but only now have the courts acknowledged that this is a work of importance. And that particular wor work uh, was researched again, once again, and identifies 94 massacre sites in the state of Queensland. And through reading lots of different historians' work covering Western Australia, the Northern Territory, Queensland, uh, the young poet, the word bomb, you know, fire, for me, fire, really also we have to talk about the massacres in this country because fire was a methodology used by white men. It travelled across from the east coast of this country across to the west coast, was used to get rid of evidence, Aboriginal bodies. It scarred the landscape. That scar is still there today. And one of the fires I was reading about was stoked for six days at Sturt Creek. And the remnants of those bodies are still the bone is there on that landscape. And I think we have to think about fire as a deliberate methodology to try and get rid of the remains after a massacre. And so for me, fire is a very important um, understanding of the violence that was perpetrated after they killed large numbers of Aboriginal people in every state across Australia. And it's interesting that it travelled so wide and so far as a way to get rid of uh, the, the evidence if any criminal cases were being, you know, presented. And Forest River Massacre is another one. The Mile Creek Massacre is another one where they used fire to get rid of people's bodies. And so I just think that um, wherever we can, we have to use our voice and talk up about these types of injustices that have happened because for too long people have gotten away with it. That's why the work I do is, you know, research-based and, and it's... It's layered with meaning and layered with metaphor symbolism. 
It's the, I mean, the Eliza Fraser story is emblematic of the way that that the, a part of colonisation, a part of its its um, machinery, is to write out our stories and put their stories in. And the other part of the complexity of the way colonisation works is that it allows people who weren't directly involved in those actions but who have benefited from them in the way colonisation continues to have distanced themselves from it. And that's a real challenge in trying to rewrite those stories. Did you look at the time when we came up? Because I yeah, said I was going to three, and I We've got and about I three more minutes. Oh, OK. <laughs> Good. Um, so I get to ask another question. OK. <laughs> How has your work inspired cultural regeneration in your community? Um, so, yes, I mean, I think one of the things I was always um, mindful of was although th th the elements of the Eliza Fraser story occurred on your country, as I said, I think that the way in which her story was used is, is um, emblematic of... I mean, it's, for me, it's, it's a, such a stark... Um, example of the way these things worked and the correlation between the telling of that story and the dispossession and massacre of your people is re it makes this a kind of, um, you know, a, a really important example of this phenomena. But this, as you say, happens everywhere. I mean, you already named just a few massacre sites that are probably better known, but all, all across our our countries, we know those those sites exist there and those stories have been written out. So, um, you know, and for me, in, in, in one way, you know, the elements of that story and its consequences are tragic. But at the time that I, that I finished writing that book, you had just got your native title handed back. And that felt like, in a way, a, an, another form of reclamation. And, of course, now there's been a renaming of that, that country back mm. to its original name. And I guess from my own perspective, it, it has heightened for me in my own work the importance of engaging not just in the deconstruction but in the reconstruction, not just in the critique of the co colonisation but in the importance of, of the regeneration. And, you know, I think... Um, these are things that we shared. We've spoken about this before, but to share it with other people, you know, your mother was very instrumental in the cultural um, survival of your language. My father had the same role. I can only speak my language now partly because of my father's work in that. Um, I, I think the connection to country for both of us has been a really big part of that. I, there are lots of ways to critique native title. As Gary Foley says, it's not land rights. It is the weakest form of title. But there is something about the fact that what it has done on our country where we do have it, we had a ceremony this last weekend. It was just a small ceremony for the hand back of a very small piece of land, but a very culturally significant one for us. It was a dance ground and we have regenerated that. So we sang songs, we danced our dance. In many ways that feels like the most defiant thing you can say to that machinery of colonisation is that mm. we're still here. So native title might be a really weak form of title, but we, in coming together around that, it's actually created a whole lot of regeneration. When I was a child and we first went back out on that country after my grandmother had been removed, my father was stolen generations, people would have said our language was dead. And um, I just look at where we are, much like when you look at the cultural regeneration that's happening on your country, I feel like that's almost the most rebellious thing that we do is to continue to speak and be you are a rye bachelor. Yeah. So on that note, we're going to end. <laughs> I think Tony will be happy with this. <laughs>
Um, Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> and I apologise for um, my timekeeping. This is the problem of being an institutional child. Um, never get taught by the Christian brothers. There's a lot of things they do wrong. One of them is to get you to know what time it is and when you, where you have to be and what time you need to finish. Um, just a couple of comments on, on um, what was said just there. I think, firstly, with Fiona's work, um, the John Batman or the Treaty Commission that she did, um, which Fiona mentioned, is on permanent exhibition at the Bob Museum in the Carlton Gardens. I would encourage people, if you haven't seen those incredible monumental tablets, um, to go up and have a look at them. You don't have to go into the museum to, to view them. So it's a free day out. It's a remarkable um, vision that Fiona had to, in a sense, deconstruct the ridiculousness of that treaty. The other thing that um, Larissa said, I think it's really important to note at this time, when people are considering the notion of, of truth-telling, which can be absolutely vital and important, but can also be a branding exercise, is that one of the things that Larissa pointed out, which we, we know so well, is that when you want to investigate the fictions of things like the um, Liza Fraser kidnapping, as Larissa just um, said to us, you don't have to scratch too deep to find these fictions, these lies and these fantasies. And one of the things that we're considering around truth-telling is that there is this, I think, false notion that we have to do this deep forensic invest investigation to find these lies. And in fact, it's not the case. Most often those lies are being paraded before us in the form of monuments which um, continue to tell fantasy. So um, thank you both for that wonderful conversation. Could pe people please thank Larissa and Fiona again. So before I introduce um, our final pairing, I do want to mention um, I was very fortunate to be asked to write an introduction to one of the books in the series this year. It's Sam Wagan Watson's remarkable poetry collection, Smoke Encrypted Whispers. Um, Sam is one of the greatest poets in this country, black or white, a remarkable young-ish man in comparison to me and just a beautiful person um, who I've known the Watson family. I knew his old man Sammy really well. Um, and I've always loved being in Sam Wagon Watson's company. Um, just as a way of appreciation for Sam's work, I just want to read one of his absolutely loving um, prose poems, Hello Squall, which is the most beautiful poem I've ever um, had the fortune to read. Twilight is for the communion of soil and water. For a brief moment, the hemorrhaging skin of the bay shares no separation with the failing land. This dark monotone body is redundant of inner detail, sheltered by a violet ceiling and blessed by an evening star. A lone witness to the silent transformation, I had no intention of paying homage to the panorama of ink and sky. There was a blacker pool in the wake, a vision of my own emptiness for which there is no horizon line. This was a special place once, but now all that resides here is a black and white photograph, a single frame of an embraced couple before a listless tide. A man was convinced that love is forever, unlike the fading picture in my mind's eye. As for the woman, she set sail to an ocean beyond, beyond the waves I tend. My heavy heart beats for you, a black rock at the bottom of the sea. So you can give Sam some applause. So the next um, pairing that we want to invite up um, are the remarkable Coleman's, as I call them. Um, they're, a, they're a dance band if you want to get them to perform. Um, we are celebrating here the remarkable novel Amazing Grace by the author Dylan Coleman, who I first met in the centre of Australia. She reminds me 11 years ago. And to join her and who wrote the writer who wrote the introduction to Amazing Grace, uh, my good friend and non based writer, Claire G. Coleman. Please welcome Dylan and Claire.
Well, first I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I show my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, let's, let's start with the elephant in the middle of the room. <laughs> yes, we're related. <laughs> Um, I remember when the first time I met Dylan, it was at the prize ceremony for um, for Black and Black and White Indigenous Writing Fellowship in 2016, which is the prize at which I won for my manuscript to Terra Nullius, which went on to be the novel Terra Nullius. And Dylan had won as well for a novel she still hasn't finished. I've sent it to the <laughs> She's just finished. Um, and, but we, when we met, um, we both turned up for the prize, not knowing each other, and the first words out of the mouth of the organisers were, you guys have the same surname, are you related? <laughs> and being Aboriginal, we both said at the same moment, give us five minutes, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we are. Um, we are related. It's way too complicated to go into now. We've only got 20 minutes. It'll take about an hour to explain <laughs> it. But um, we're here to talk about Millen, um, Dylan's amazing book, Amazing Grace, um, which is... I should introduce who we are first, shouldn't I? We'll get to that. Um, my name's Claire G. Coleman. I'm a Royal Manunga person from the south coast of Western Australia. Um, my family also partly Irish, hence the common surname. And I've written four books, best known of which is Tawanolius, and the most recent of which is a novel called Enclave. And Dylan Coleman is a Gogota woman who lives in Adelaide. She's my relative, like I said, and she's a lecturer in Indigenous Health at Uni Adelaide, is it? Yeah, Adelaide University. University. Adelaide. And the book we're talking about is Maze and Grace, um, which is a fictionalised story of um, the life of Dylan's mother, Mercy Glastonbury. And I suppose, because, I mean, I haven't got any notes. I'm that organised. But um, <laughs> Dylan and I um, speak a lot. We hang out a lot. And every time I'm in South Australia, I visit Dylan and I visit Mercy. So we spend a lot of time together. So I figured we wouldn't need notes. And we did radio a few days ago as well, a couple of weeks ago. So the first question, Dylan, is having written this... When you're writing the story of your mother, who is my cousin... Um, I know, it's so complicated. Why um, did you go with fiction and not a straight biography? Yeah, I, I often refer to this as my mum's story. Um, and I did it for my PhD work, but my mum's name should have been on that PhD as well. But for the purposes I asked, it couldn't be. So, but our next book will have her name on it. Um, so I suppose we could have, you know, I could have written a biography. Um, you know, my mum could have written an autobiography, I suppose. Um, but I think... Um, what was really important, because we did a lot of reviewing a lot of literature over this period of time, to look at how we might approach this. And what my mum said from the beginning, what she said all the way through, was that she really wanted to connect with the audience, you know, who was reading this, the, reader, the readership. She wanted to have them look through her eyes, to feel what she was feeling as a little girl, um, to live through that trauma, but also the great, you know, joy and connectedness with family as well. And um, so we, we did a lot of reading and discussing, and at one stage we'd had a range of different generations of women's voices where, um, you know, we had from today my voice, my mother's, uh, my grandmother and great-grandmother's voice. Um, and... You know, my supervisor at the time was really excited about that and Mum had gone up to um, the Torres Strait for a while with, with her niece and she came back and she said, no, no, I know we talked about this but I really want it from the perspective that I would have had as a little girl. So we ended up writing it in Aboriginal English and Gugutha as she would have spoken because she felt that that was the best way for people to be able to step into her world and experience what she experienced. And that, that to me, is, is the most surprising thing about Maze and Grace, and, and possibly the most powerful and beautiful, is, is the language where you weave together um, Aboriginal English and Gugutha, like, and it becomes almost like a song. 
and there's a musicality to the language that you can only get, that you only really get in Australia with Aboriginal English. Um, and I suppose, like, the, one of our first conversations after I read um, Amazing Grace, our first conversation was trying to work out how we related. The second conversation we ever had <laughs> was sometime after that, after we read Amazing Grace. Um, and I was asking you why you wrote it in, in Aboriginal English and why you actually use so many Gurgada words. And the important thing is that none of the Aboriginal words are translated in, this, in, your, in the manuscript. There is a glossary, though. There is a glossary, yeah. yes. And so, I often tell people, take a photocopy so that it's easier when you're so, reading so it. Why, <laughs> so why did you choose to not translate the Gurgada words in the text? Um, well... Mum was quite strong about this too. She said that, you know, I mean, she's an anthropologist. Um, she's an intelligent woman. Um, she's got a number of degrees under her belt. Um, and she said, you know, she really wanted... I suppose it's part of that decolonisation process as well um, that's um, been spoken about uh, just recently, that she really... Um, wanted and you find in the first few chapters it is a real effort you know because of so much language she wanted people to go on a journey where they had to work a little bit hard you know uh, to be invited into that world uh, you know non-indigenous readers she said that um, you know we we're speaking in the language of the coloniser now um, you know, we should be speaking our own languages to each other and understand each other's language as we would have when we came together for trade and, and ceremony years ago. Um, but because the colonial process has been so thorough, we're all sitting here speaking English and understanding in English. Um, and so she, she really wanted the reader to actually have to work a little bit in the first few chapters to be invited in with the language to, to be invited into the story. So that was something that she was strong about, you know. And some people, they struggle a little bit with the first few chapters, you know, but that's intentional. You know, they have to work, work to get in, into that um, connectedness and the rhythm, the rhythm that you speak about. I, I, I found it, the first time I read it, the, um, the Gugada words to be um, kind of unsettling and displacing. But that that in in the end became in kind of in a good way, because it it struck me that um, when the when the colonizers, colonizers came here, our ancestors were forced to learn their language and speak in their words, and were unsettled and displaced and confused and yes. um, could make no sense of this colonizer world because they were using the wrong language. And to me, it felt like, it, although I, I'm you know I'm indigenous, so I know this kind of displacement and, and alienation from country thing. But if, to me, it struck me as a really good idea to intentionally displace the readers because, let's face it, um, we're writing Indigenous literature in Australia and therefore we can assume our audience is majority non-Indigenous because Australians are. Did, is the dis, dis, displacement kind of of the audience intentional or is it kind of... The reader, and, yeah. And accident. Because I, I personally love um, knocking people off their perches in a really confusing for them way. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Um, yeah, it, it, is, it has been intentional. That was Mum's intention. Um, you know, I, I was a little concerned, you know. Um, are people going to be able to understand this, you know? Um, and... We, we even talked about, do we put a glossary in or do we not know? We definitely need a glossary, otherwise people won't know. And I get, I've had, um, you know, emails from people um, saying, you know, I've learnt the Google, some of the Google the language now through this and, and I speak it to my kids now. I say, you know, you buggity minya gidja mugga, get in the the bath, you know, you dirty little kids. <laughs> so put your boogities on, put your shoes on. So um, that it's, it's made its way into some people's households, you know, non-Indigenous people's households. So, um, you know, the process of decolonisation um, is happening through people picking the book up, reading it and maybe learning our language as well. Um, so that, that's kind of nice as well. And in different parts of the world, my mum gets excited. You know, she finds out, oh, 
Grace has travelled to Germany, you know, because we, we hear that the book's been sent to Germany or someone's reading it in Russia uh, on the uh, railway line or, you know, a whole range of... It, it travels. So um, she gets rather excited to think that little Grace is travelling all over the world when she hasn't been able to. So, yeah. It's, it's, it strikes me sometimes that... Um, there, there are languages, there are, there are fictional languages that there probably are more speakers in Australia of than there are many Aboriginal languages. For example, I have met, um, because I'm a total nerd, a large number of people who speak Tolkien's Elvish. That's a, that's a made-up language. And the reason, the reason people know that language is because it's in books. Yes. So in a, in a way, the, the use of Gugura words saves those words because there are people out there who know those words who would never otherwise... Because people, I think they like absorbing the language from books. So I can see why this kind of, why, why this use of the of Google language and of Aboriginal English um, brings the words into, into the language of Australia. And um, that's quite a good effort. And you've certainly used a lot more language words than I'd use in any of my books. And that's because um, Dylan knows more language words than I know words of my language. Um, so... I suppose the... I'm trying to think of another question now. So oh, but, um, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I've spoken with my nanas, with my aunties, um, with uncles, you know, in the process of writing this. So I've learnt a lot mm. more of my language. My grandmother was a fluent Gugga speaker and, um, you know, my mum could speak with her as well. I'm not a fluent speaker, but... Um, I learnt a lot more um, in, in the process of writing this book. And Mum was recalling as well as we were, you know, she'd say, oh, no, you know, the, the word is, this is the word, this is how it's pronounced. And so, you know, um, no, no, I would have said it like this, you know. So there was a lot in the learning. There was a lot of references in this that I grew up with as a child, so I know, and I know the story of Mum growing up on the mission. But... Um, it sort of deepened my knowledge of language a lot and brought back that communal learning. In fact, when we go out bush now, because um, we've got traditional country where we um, maintain our rock holes um, out at uh, Pariba, Yalabina and um, uh, out bush um, and Yumbra, um, Seven Sisters Dreaming, and so our women go out when the seven sisters wake up in the sky and go to sleep, and we clean our rock holes and uh, do cultural maintenance. And so um, Maize and Grace gets taken out there, and around the fire, it gets red. And everybody laughs, and then they recall the story, and then they, the young ones are learning, and they add their own stories, you know, that, that connects with it. Um, and, you know, so it, it sort of continues, you know, through the generations as well. So, yeah, I'm hoping it will when I'm long and gone, well, long gone, yeah. And um, what, what does, what does uh, Mercy think of um, the book making it to a First Nations Classics edition? Oh, my gosh, she was <laughs> so excited, <laughs> you know. Um, I said to her mum, you know, like she rang up... Um, Oh, good luck today. I'm really excited. It's just so wonderful. Um, I wish she could be here, but she doesn't um, move very much these days um, and she doesn't get around much. So, um, and I said, well, what would you like to convey to the audience? And she said, oh, well, I just really hope that they'll enjoy the book. But she said, tell them to buy 10 copies each. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's enough for 10 copies each, but she said, and, and give them to other people so that they can learn as well. So um, she's very excited, as and, you know. And I, I must say, there's a, I've got a running joke about Aboriginal literature, that Aboriginal literature is a perfect Christmas gift for racist uncles. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember that when Christmas is coming. <laughs> um, I, I suppose. Um, I suppose. Next question is: um, are, are you working on any, on any more books? Because I mean, we, we, you need more books. Um, and what are, what books are you working? on? I know you will tell. Do you want to mention your next book? The one you've just. She's just finished a book. Finally, it'd be bothering her to finish a book. 
for we met when when we meet eight years ago nine years ago I've been telling her to finish her that finish it that long yeah, it's like it, I'm constantly feeling guilty on I only Claire's <laughs> gonna tell me off again I'm really looking forward to seeing her but she's gonna tell me off so um yeah so that book I finished for my masters but you know some stories hold a lot of trauma Mum certainly did, and we worked through so much, so much of the trauma through this story. Um, but my dad's story also holds an incredible amount of trauma. And, you know, sometimes those stories you just can't let go of, like the editor saying, come on, and it's like... And um, so... But I've sort of let that go. And um, working on a short film to sort of, you know, pitch for a, a feature for that one. Um, Amazing Grace, my brother and I have written the first episode of a TV series, a a six-part series that was long listed for the Monty Miller. So hopefully within a few years this might be seen on the little screen. Now I'd love to see that. Yeah, so, um, but you know, you've got to do Grace justice. She's such a um, you know, cheeky, unbelievable little character. You, That's because she's know. based on Mercy and Mercy's <laughs> cheeky. <laughs> she still is. She still is, yeah. Um, yeah, she's still very much the matriarch of the family and um, that's for sure. So, yeah, um, I'm doing a lot of script writing. I've, I've written, um, you know, since um, 2013, uh, 11 years ago, uh, with the workshop there, Um that uh, I've, I've done about six, seven short films and um, starting to write long form. So just completed a feature film um, with a gentleman called Greg Reed. He uh, used to be a Hollywood script director and has directed A-listers. Um, and so we've written an incredible script um, that we're hoping will get up um, called Desert Ice. And it's an incredible script because it's based on or inspired by a, a real life story of um, the first Aboriginal ice hockey team in Australia. <laughs> Believe it or not. Uh, and it's called, they're called the Ghana Boomerangs. Um, and it, it's a great, a great story because um, the Ice Factor is a program that supports youth at risk and there's certain rules that the kids have to um, attend um, school, you know, regularly, etc., and then they get to do the ice hockey. So, uh, good supportive program. They've got to do well with their marks, etc. And um, so, this story is that they, in real life, went to um, Canada and they played against a Cree team and won. It must so, be spoiler freezing. alert! <laughs> yeah, the whole, it's, it's incredible. I, I won't say you in re, tell you in real life what they said. But, yeah, so, <laughs> They got off the I mean, bus. I, went, I, went to, I went to Vancouver last year in summer and it was still fucking cold. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we said no swearing, honey Claire. No one can stop me swearing. <laughs> just... just, uh, um, so um, it, it, it really is inc- incredibly good to see you, Dylan. And I think everyone yeah. should actually go out and buy Amazing Grace. All of you. I, yes. want, I want them to sell out. I don't want to see any up the back there. I don't want to see any books up the back there. Just buy everything on the table. Just get rid of it all. Um, and, and also, just a plug for Desert Ice, because there's also a, a community um, cultural fund. that it, There's a few brochures up the back too that if anybody wants to donate or even invest, um, you know, it would be amazing to see that film, um, you know, globally, and also because we're going to write a book, Greg and I, um, based on the feature film script that we've just written. So, yeah. So um, we're nearly out of time here, so we'll start saying... We don't have to get up quite yet, but... um, (laughs) 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 Um, Just, look, I would like to um, reiterate what Tony said before, which is, like, these First Nation Classics books, they're all brilliant, and you should just buy them all. I mean, I'm, I'm not on the First Nation Classic list for this one because I have a different publisher. But I wrote the introduction for, for Amazing Grace, um, and I was incredibly honoured to be um, invited to write the introduction by, by Dylan and by Mercy. Um, apparently I was their first choice. I'm not sure I believe that, but apparently I was. <laughs> um, so um, thank you, Dylan, and thank you, Will Ascend, and thank you, Tony, for introducing us. Thank you, Tony. It was, um, I guess we'll wind up there. Any, any last words, um, Dr Coleman? Oh. <laughs> I usually, like I said, only use that to fight evil, you know, <laughs> support letters and um, 
wielding it to DCP. If she's going to call me Auntie Claire, I'm going to call her Dr Coleman. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, Claire. <laughs> um, what can I say? Um, it, you know, my, my mum and I are just beyond um, absolutely over the moon and feel it's a real privilege to have been chosen um, for this um, amazing series and... Um, how important it is, I think, for recognition for First Nation writers um, and how important our voices are, you know, um, given the history, given, um, you know, the level of destruction to language, um, how incredibly important it is to, to support that and support the Indigenous literature landscape, First Nation landscape here um, in Australia. Um, so please, yeah, I just encourage you to buy and read more literature and talk about it. Tell your friends. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dylan. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you to the comments. Um, much better than the Veronicas, I reckon. <laughs> um, just one of the observations, it, it, you know, it seems so obvious when you hear it, that um, Dylan talking about non-Aboriginal people actually getting the language of, of the novel and using it. Um, it's just it's fantastic to hear that. Um, and obviously, I'm sure important to your family to, to hear that as well. Um, we're going to close with a performance um, in a moment. Before we do that, I, I don't need to say anything more about the books. Um, Claire's plugged them quite well. <laughs> they are available, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I do want to say is that we've listened to five remarkable First Nations women up here tonight, and I want to make two observations that I've made before. And one is that we are led by women in our, in our communities, not as homemakers, although my mum knows how to make a good bed still, I suppose, but as remarkable women who are really at the forefront of the struggles that we have to undertake. And without women being at the forefront, we, we wouldn't be here, simple as that. We, we'd be lost. And I think it's indicative of listening to the five women um, we've heard tonight. And the other thing about this is, I suppose, what I might call a personal frustration, regardless of how people felt about The Voice last year. I think there was something of a patronising tone that if we invite First Nations people to the big table, they will learn to be part of the big table and will appreciate sitting here with us and advising us in a way that we do not have to adhere to if we don't want to. I think that what we've heard tonight, and I, I will point to Larissa Baran again last year at the Bad Crime Festival in Sydney. Larissa introduced two remarkable First Nations women who were working at the forefront of issues around courts, issues around incarceration of children, issues around family violence, issues around protection of children. And all I thought was we have all the voices we need we just need to get out of the way and let those voices lead us, and that has been shown again tonight. So we've had five great women here. I do, though, to close, want to introduce a, a wonderful young man, a Yorta Yorta musician, an artist known as Dreaming Now. Um, Neil Morris, um, I've worked with Neil before. He's a Yorta Yorta poet, musician, and community-based activist. But I think what I'd like to say personally about Neil, he is, he is such a beautiful soul and he is one of those young people, again, that I'm um, always in awe of, who is always fighting for the protection of country, fighting against the devastation that his country and other countries suffer under colonisation. And again, uh, a young Yorta Yorta man who will lead us to a future where we are able to protect our country 
with force. So could please people welcome Neil to the stage to close. I, you won't have to put up with me again. Neil's voice will be the last one you hear. Nengana Uta Nengana Kulan Bik Nengana Kulan Yakapna and Nengana Uta Yakapna Yakapna Nirnoma Tungudja Tomatamanga Uta Gat Nil Yoti Yoti Yir Awawa Achi Baya I get back to the land. I acknowledge this powerful land that we are on of the Kulan Nations people. It's an honor to be able to be on this specific part of country of the Wewarang Wurundjeri mob. I acknowledge my own connections through Jajawarang to the Kulin Nation and then back to uh, my other homelands of Yorta Yorta where I was born and raised. It's a beautiful privilege to be able to be here tonight to share in such a, a special and precious space and I'll leave it there and allow the music to do the talking. This is a, a piece that I was very blessed to be able to do a remake of in 2020. It goes by the name of Get Back to the Land from our beautiful dear Uncle Archie Roach. Expected. Cultures torn apart from many intense pressures Destructive misdirection from election to election We need transformation to address it But how we gonna heal if the people's disconnected? How we gonna heal if our mother's disrespected? So much information, facts are rejected Neglected, willful ignorance, yelling at truth is not accepted Rejected while society fall apart into depression As sacredness of land is waiting for all to be connected See, it's so sacred from the coast forest, the desert from thousands years ago into the present. See everywhere we step in, we step upon a blessing. Whilst they hear the land singing ancestors, gardens never left us. Back to the land, good here, Lord. No question to live on unconditional love with each breath here. Get back to the land, cause you will never, ever, ever, ever hurt you. You've got to get It feels like I woke up in a nightmare But then everything is right When I got the land right here But in my right ear Is the pain and devastation As the colonial destruction continues all across our nations Rejection of the fact We give it our lands across all places of Sacredness from the tour straight to cool a nation And Yorta Yorta my home Original placement as our mothers pleading for us to heed our calls in desperation Singing our hearts and minds and spirits for the transformation Be patient, I am here to clear your pain and frustration Just be with me, I understand you and I love you and I always will No matter how long you've been away, you are my child And every second I pray forth that you can elevate into peace with the sacred laws Come back to the land for liberation it's time to make it right. Let's heal these wounds and lamentations. Oh God. 